Hello and welcome to this special World Cup webinar in conjunction with the Coach Emmanuel. I'm John and I'm the co-founder of InspireCoachEd.com and I'll be the host for the next 20 minutes. So today we've got two panellists ready to discuss today's webinar theme, which is England and building from the back. Um, before we begin, I'll ask each of the panellists then to introduce themselves. So Gerard Jones, would you like to introduce yourself briefly? Yeah, Gerard Jones, a licensed coach. I've been coaching for over 13 years. I've worked across most levels in the professional and grassroots game. I've worked as an academy coach, head of coaching, under 21 assistant. I've been a non-league first team manager. I've been lucky to work in the US as well as a director of coaching and at collegiate level. Okay, fantastic. And then we have Stephen Crane from the coaching manual. Yes, uh, cheers, guys. Um, Stephen Crane um, played a little bit in the United States as well as uh, coached over there for a short time. I'm now the head of player development for the coaching manual, and I also work at Manchester United Academy with their under 11s and the U14s as well. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much, Stephen. So, yeah, today we are on Facebook Live. It's our first test, so bear with us. Um, I have got the Facebook uh, chat now up. So if you're watching on Facebook, you can comment beneath the video and we'll, we will be able to see that as well. OK, so um, I'm now going to hand over to Gerard and we're going to begin the topic for today. OK, Gerard, over to you. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because we were just talking about before we started. I think one of the most exciting things what we'll notice going into this World Cup with England is the level of detail that Southgate recruited the players around. So the, the detail around his selection, I think the change in terms of system of play, I know in previous World Cups we've played with a back four, usually within a 4-2-3-1 uh, or a, a variation of. I think this year going with a back three, it's going to look more exciting. Um, one of the biggest things I want to pay particular emphasis on is, I believe, the use of Pickford. I think his selection of quality of pass and the ability to retain possession is going to be key, especially if you're wanting to build any of your teams on playing out from the back, playing out from the goalkeeper. Uh, I want to also pay attention to, if you look at the selection around playing with a back three, it's all down to personnel. So we noticed across the two previous games against Costa Rica and obviously Nigeria, it was different selection in personnel. In one lineup, he had players such as Phil Jones, uh, obviously he had Gary Cahill, different selections, etc. Now, Maguire, who I think is quite an interesting one, when he's played with players, he's got over 50 odd, uh, over 51 dribbles in the Premier League which is more than any other centre-back in the Premier League. If you look at Henderson in terms of his pass rate, playing as a number six or a number four, depending on what system of play you operate, he's got over 84% pass success rate, of which a lot of his pass is 70% of forward. And I think if you look at the games that he was played or Dyer was played, depending on who was in the system of play, whether it was Walker, Stones, Maguire, or uh, like I said, Phil Jones, etc., whether it was Delph or whether it was Trippier or whether it was Ashley Young and Rose on, as the wing-back positions, the different players he played, I think these are going to be the key. Who are the players that he selects at the back three? What are the attributes they're bringing to the game, you know, in terms of their decision-making? Uh, I think that the fact that Maguire likes to step in and overload possession at times, same with uh, Stones, who's very comfortable on the ball, I think that's a huge asset. And the ability to obviously see the, the forward pass, I don't know what you think, Steve, opening in. I noticed you've done a, a bit of analysis going into this, but I think Henderson, as a quarterback role, I think he's going to be pivotal to this back three system of play. Yeah, Jared, I think, like you say, obviously, you, you know, you're going to go through what I wrote, you know, um, soon. But I think, like you say, it's key. A lot of people think when you play out to a back three, that Pickford is just going to distribute to the back three. But really, I think when you play a back three, especially the way Southgate has played, I think Pickford will try and hit the furthest man forward quickly, whether that's going to be the number 10, whether he starts with Deli Ali or Jesse or someone like that, or he's going to try and hit the wide men early. So I think with the back three, I think you'll find Tunisia maybe start to try and press nice and high against us and trying to exploit exploit the defenders and try and get them mother he wants. So I think Pickford will use his distribution qualities to try and play you know, forward quickly. So like you say, I think the personnel is key, not only for the back three, but I think the personnel is key in the centre mid as well, whether he goes with one, or two sitting in, um, we'll you know wait and see on that one. Yeah, well, it's funny because in the two games, the obviously they're all rotating into different shapes during animations of play. We know that, but it was interesting how at times it looked like there was two, and then at other times it was one quarterback role, which was quite interesting. I mean, at times you could almost class it as like a, a three-one-four-two in possession, and I think it'll be interesting to see if you're talking about that highest pass whether he's going to have two forwards as an outlet 
or if he's going to play with just one, like he did with Vardy, or if he's going to have Kane and, and, and Sterling. Uh, I think one yeah. of the biggest things I quite like is, as you said there, how they've built possession whilst under that high press. So the comfortableness on the ball. And I, I also like it, I think it's key, anyone listening to this and they're trying to think about what does that look like for me in my environment with my players in my team? Um, I think one of the biggest keys is teaching players how to empty and fill space. So you'll remember in one of the games, I think it was against Nigeria, Harry Kane actually rotated into like a quarterback role, got the ball from deep from a from a penetrative pass. And I think he hit a direct ball into the forward player. And I think little moments like that are gonna be are gonna be key. Uh, the question is for the guys listening is obviously we're going through a lot of detail. What does that look like on a session? What I'll do is I'm just going to share my screen with everyone. I'm going to take advantage of the coaching manual. Uh, if that works. So can you guys see my screen? Yep. So yep. Yes, mate. Yep. What I was, and again, there's a million and one ways you can do this, but I think simplicity is key. We're talking a lot about the different lines of possession, what type of passes you're going to make, keeper trying to see the highest pass, rotational movement. We're talking a lot about the detail in terms of where they're positioning. I think the absolute key whenever you're constructing a practice is what is the scenario that you want to replicate? So is it the action on a goal kick or is it the action after a goal kick? Is it the action in possession? So if we look at, for example, a very simple practice, and I'll do this rushing through, um, if we've got a box and we create two grids almost, if we like, what we could do, for example, is we could have, and you could do this in any session, if you've got your back three, how they were positioned, where they're not all on the same receiving line, and this is typically how they played, with, as you said, you might have that quarterback role, you might create a scenario where it looks like this, so everything's relevant to the game. So, for example, for the guys watching in, people talk about rondos. You could use this as ro a rondo. You could call it if you wanted to. Effectively, it's just positional possession. There's a 4v2. And that could be your back three there or your goalkeeper and your two centre halves. If you want to play with a back four and your deep line midfielder. But the key, which I liked what you mentioned in terms of integrating goalkeepers and integrating an outlet pass is identifying the ability to hit the number nine. So if I was to do, and I can do these in any shapes, but if that's my number nine there, this could be a very simple pass here. Is this showing up okay on your screen? Yes, yes it's clear. They can play around. Now, I want to pay particular emphasis to this. What we noticed a lot against, obviously, Costa Rica and Nigeria was the ability for England to play around and invite the opposition press to be able to make that third line pass. And then in this practice, we would teach that receiving angles. So the ball could play through, you're taking two players out of the game, and everything's based on the scenario and the challenge. So as a coach, you're challenging the players. This number six or a number four here, the, the question you could be asking this player is, can you see the goal before you receive the ball? Or can you see the number nine before you receive the ball? Straight away, he's going to do what? He's going to open his shoulders. As he gets that back foot take, can he look to play into the number nine? As he plays there, I mean, I might have missed a couple of players off here. I'm, obviously, I'm just showing a rough example. There could be a defending player in there. Oop, I can drag it across. Well, you're set up, Jared, on that one, mate. You know, I'd like to jump in and say, um, I think, yeah. I think as well for the coaches as well out there, I have a lot of coaches ask me, what can I do if I only have eight players or if they only have 10 players for training? Well, here's a fantastic way that Jared's showing here of ways that you can make practice really simple. So I like the word that I used before, simplicity. Um, I think a lot of us coaches get drawn up on the complexity of the sessions and we don't actually forget about what's what's the actual you know plan for the session and what we're trying to get out. So I think Jared, using obviously the coaching manual tool, I think it's a fantastic way of showing how you can do a session if you've got six players or like you say, you know, progressing it like it is now to 10 players. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think there was a, there was one, I mean, I, I'll just, I, I love how simple the coaching manual is. I mean, you can see I'm playing around here, playing out from 
the bass players, um, and it's been quick to create. There's another one I always get asked, how do you teach players to create angles or to have the confidence to receive in between lines? And I noticed that in the game, whether it was Deli Ali or whether it was Raheem Sterling, um, I know sometimes Cal Walker was actually getting in the way a little bit uh, at times on the same receiving line as the number six and number four. But how do you get players to recognise how to create space, how to run to receive or run to deceive? So another example we could do, and going back to your point, how do we make this as simple as possible? It might be something where, in fact, I already created it just before we went into the, into the webinar. So I call it playing out with a back three. I'm a big believer in safe zones or receiving zones. Apologies for it not being like Picasso. So <laughs> you might have your you might have your 4v2 there, which is what happened in a lot of the systems. Actually, against Costa Rica, when they were defending out of possession, at times they had a 5-3-2 out of possession shape. So if that's the opposition shape and how we can play, this is another simple example. If you've only got two players, or you can keep the ball... As the ball's transferred up to that number nine there, again, the situation repeats itself. These guys on the outside would join up and create the over, the overload again. What this middle channel here is, can you see where my mouth is? My uh, mouse is moving now. Yeah. That? that could be what you call a safe zone or a receiving zone. This guy here, I've highlighted, that's a defender. This guy here is the yellow player. If we're talking about challenging players and we um can you still hear me yep and we're talking about developing the ability to deal with pressure from behind we know that the game is dealing with pressure from mainly behind and to the side rather than faced up here's a great example of teaching you number two how to create space to run to receive and you can manipulate the distance of this shape so if you wanted the receiving line to be tight, because maybe that's what the opposition are giving you, if the opposition are defending in a high press with a, a full court press, or they're doing a low block and the lines are really tight, this could be another scenario where he receives in there, but it's a safe zone. So he has three seconds to receive the ball, have confidence to turn and find the number nine who creates an angle. So you're creating the 2v1. And then you could build it up to now that defender who's coming behind him follows him. So now he can put part, he can put a bit of pressure on. And if that ball's played in, you've got your scenarios. You've got your, if it, the ball's here, look, you've got your up, back, through, which is a great principle that was used throughout Man City's campaign. And if you actually look at the detail from the games, a lot of the time when Sterling was getting the ball, he was literally circulating the ball with a quick one-touch pass, bounce, bounce, bounce. The goal that came from Rashford, do you remember Rashford's long shot? That actually came from Henderson, who we mentioned before, getting on the ball off a bounce pass, playing a ball around the opposition defender, who's then received it, played it in, it's been a combination into Rashford and his dribble and shoot. And I just think these are just simple scenarios of how you can make the game realistic. I don't think we do enough. We're, we're getting better at it, but I don't think there's enough coaches who really think about the level of detail that they go into in simplifying the game and making it look like a game scenario. And then obviously how you would build that on is as you progress through your phases, your learning phases. Yeah, spot on, Jared. Spot on. I think you covered it all. Um, you know, I think if we go back to the country as well, is um, you can you you know you can play that with whatever the system you really want as well. You can change your Brondo boxes and change your sizes, but... When they're playing with the back three, that's just basically what it is. Keeping your width, keeping space. And do you know what the key is as well? Trying to gain the confidence in each other to play out as well. I think a lot of the time in this country, we seem to be a bit scared to have the ball or a bit scared to let you know defenders dribble out and play. Now, especially when you work with younger players under eights, under nines, under tens, let them have confidence to play. I think Jared mentioned before the flexibility of Kane dropping in to receive the ball. Now, I think that's key, you know, Whenever you're coaching kids, it changes when you get older, obviously, more tactical advice, etc. But when you're teaching under nines, under tens, so under twelves, let them just play and let them get on the ball and let them gain the confidence to play out. Now, hopefully, this generation of the players for the country is going to have that quality and going to have that belief on the ball and trust on the ball to play out. So we should hopefully see that coming up to the World Cup on Monday. No, I agree. I think it's vital. 
I think just allowing people to have the confidence to stay on the ball. I love that in the game, you actually saw people communicating non-verbally and verbally. And I think that's another yeah. trick that we don't do enough on, supporting kids to have the confidence to demand the ball, stay on the ball, find solutions. And especially with the younger ages, if you're going to make mistakes, not a problem. Keep getting on the ball. Uh, keep trying yeah. to get on the pass. Start again, rebuild. So, yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what were some fantastic. of the things, you know, going from your experience at Manchester United and with some of the players that you've worked with during your time, do you use similar practices? Or, and do you do, how would you build them sort of practices onto another level to keep challenging the players throughout a session? Like you say, I think it depends on the shape that you play. Um, so, you know, obviously part of the warm-ups, you know, at the club and, uh, you know, quite a lot of Premier League clubs are going to be rondo boxes. So you can set your rondo boxes up however you really want. So at the start of the session, you can change them as well. So you can... You could do a rondo box, like you said there previously, or you could change it if you're working on defending. You can start to uh, work on your strikers, the way they close down, angles close down. And then I think from the rondo boxes, you can go on to progressive team sessions. So um, obviously you'll see, you know, by the coach manual platform, there's hundreds and hundreds of sessions on there um, in terms of defensive blocks and attacking blocks. So I think the progression is going to be down to the players as well. Um, and I think it's going to be down to your players understanding the levels as well. A lot of the coaches who come to me saying that they don't really get the practice now that fully because the practice is too complex for them. So um, I think, yeah. well, especially at our club, the practices are very simple. They're very clear, very simple, and it's more going to be about the players. And the players get the principles out, trying to really drill the principles of what we're trying to get across to the players, uh, but progressing it slightly, slowly but surely, and then trying to you know get it into the game at the end as well. I see too many sessions that don't end up with an actual game of football now. To me, if you're going to work through the blocks or you're going to work through your progressions or whatever you're going to be working on, it's fine having your rondo boxes, it's fine putting it into nice skill practices, but you want to see it as well in the game. So that's the way that we try to progress it really as well. Uh, you, the younger age groups, it starts out with more small-sided games, play, practice, play, whole part, whole model. Um, but when you go into the age groups, obviously that can change. But yeah, like you say, um, I think it depends on the shape that you want to play, but a lot of people get worried about 4 3 3 and they've only got 10 players that can't coach it. Of course, you can. You can do exactly what I said before. Um, if you're struggling, there's loads of sessions online that are going to push you through it as well. I, I just love everything you're saying there around the, the big thing is the principles. I think a lot of people are stressing or trying to overcoat sort of patterns, but the key is allowing yeah. the players to actually recognize the pattern. The players have got to see the picture. You can, of course, you can, uh, it might be a nut back and through, it might be. But the key when you're coaching is, can you say to the players, give them a challenge, can you find a solution of how you receive this ball to get the ball forward? How can you lose your marker? How can you create space for yourself or a teammate to receive? How can you take a player out of the yeah. game? So it's all question-based. Um, and I love the play practice players the US have introduced, the whole back hole. And I think it's just, it's managing that and making it as simple as, you possibly can, which I, I completely agree with you. I love it. Uh, I don't yeah, think because, you know, I think it's going to be great. I think, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's, I think it's fantastic the way they brought out the play, practice play model now. Um, you know, we talk about whatever we're, we're talking about. So today we're talking about playing out from the back. Now, to play out from the back, you've got to be comfortable on the ball. If you're not comfortable on the ball, you can't play out from the back. It doesn't matter what coach you've got, what fantastic grass you've got. If you can't be comfortable receiving the ball, dribbling out and playing, then you can't play out from the back. So like you say, I think it goes all the way down to U8, U9, U10. And I think, like you say, if the United States can grasp that as well, I think that'd be fantastic. Yeah. I'll tell you what, there's a point I want to make on jumping on your point there about the, the key is that confidence and the ability to, to recognise solutions and look after the ball, the technique, how good you are on the ball. And one of the things I think a lot of coaches will be looking at, that, like you mentioned, is, well, I can't do this session with my players. How do I deprogress it? How do I pitch it at the level that I'm working at? And one of the things I would say is everything you do in your warm-ups, from your warm-up linking through your phases, have a ball. Even ball mastery warm-up, getting the back foot take, front foot take. It might be passing and receiving between us three now, but then there might be added pressure. When I play to you, when I play to, to uh, John, I'm closing John down. He must stay on the ball for four seconds. So straight away, I'm putting him in a 1v1. And he's got to find a solution to be able to deal with that, whether it's using his arms, like Dyer will do, rolling him, find a solution. And then next time he's beating him, Bob, now I play to you. And, and I just think there's so many different ways you can do it. But the key for coaches is if, you, if you're confused on how to 
really hone the basics. There's a million ways that you can you can deprogress it to get the same pictures. Yeah. That's yeah. Okay. Okay, brilliant. So, yeah, we are unfortunately out of time. Time has flown again. Uh, so that does bring the end of the webinar today. So before we go, um, yeah, Gerard, where can the, uh, the attendees, where can the people watching on Facebook find you on social media? You can find me on my Twitter handle is Gerard underscore Jones, G-E-R-A-R-D underscore Jones. You can also get me on my website, www.gerardschoolofootball.com. I'm free. Anyone can get in contact with me. I'm always happy and willing to share. I also wrote a book on communication through the use of game calls, which is a great book for you to really simplify your detail and the information you're giving to clients. Brilliant. And what about you, Stephen? Where can you be found? Yes, John. So I think, like you said, you know, obviously we've uh, run out of time today, but what I'll do, John, is I'll send out an email to you that we can share on social media as well. But you can find me via the Coach Manual platform um, at the Coach Manual on Twitter, or you can find me at Steve Crane 13 on Twitter as well. And like Jared said, any questions you've got, I'm more than you know, happy to share them with you. Brilliant. We'll follow up then. OK, so stay tuned to our Twitter as well at Inspire Coach Ed for clips of the webinar. Um, I'll be back on Tuesday with um, actually for a post game webinar for England's game on the Monday. So Tuesday, 9 p.m., I'll be joined by Gerard, Paul Bright of the Coaching Manual and also a sports psychologist as well. OK, thank you for watching. Cheers. Thank you.